Hey guys and welcome back for another episode in my Unsolved Mystery series where today I want to talk to you about a very recent case from here in the UK, a case known in the media rather tastelessly as the Sudbury Bag of Bones. This name refers to the remains of an unidentified man that were found just two years ago in Sudbury, southwest Suffolk, and still two years on, the Suffolk media are making regular appeals for more information as to both the identity of the man and the identity of his killer. However, this is not a case I'd ever heard of until I came across it very recently, and as someone who tends to keep up with news like this, I mean it's literally my job to do so, the fact that I hadn't come across it until now suggests that it does need a lot more coverage. If you live here in England, specifically in the areas I'm going to be mentioning today, please make sure to share this episode, or just share the story, talk about it, bring it up at your next pub trip with your friends, help spread the word. We're going to be talking more about genealogical testing later in this episode, but for reasons you'll come to see, that's probably not something that's going to happen in this case, so instead just spreading the word is of utmost importance. This is going to be a shorter episode today, as the authorities haven't shared all too much about this case, we don't have a huge amount of information to talk about, but in my eyes that makes it all that much more important to talk about it, to share this story. So Sudbury is a market town in the southwest of Suffolk in England, sat on the River Stour. Out of the 2011 census, it had a population of just over 13,000 people, and it's been historically known for its art, but now it's just more of a market town. It has this twice weekly market in the centre, just a fairly quiet place from what I can gather. I'm not from Sudbury myself, so if you are from the area, then please feel free to put your input in the comments down below, but it doesn't seem like much really happens there. Until in August 2020, the bag of bones was found. In the early afternoon of Thursday the 27th of August 2020, a member of the public spotted two black bin bags floating in the River Stour, near Meadowgate and Croft Bridge, and they reported them to a ranger. Just after 4.35pm, the ranger called the police after moving the bags and establishing the contents of them. It seemed to him to be human bones. As you can imagine, the police set up a crime scene pretty quickly, or actually set up two crime scenes, one around the river where the bags were discovered, and another around the spot where the bags had been moved to by the ranger. By the next day, the bones were 100% confirmed to be human remains, and due to the very suspicious circumstances, it was, and still is, being treated as a murder investigation. We can be pretty sure that this man didn't put himself in these black bags. A week after the initial discovery, more human remains were recovered from the river and DNA testing would soon confirm that they all belonged to the same person, but it would later be confirmed that it was not a complete body, so some parts are still missing. According to an article on ITV written just two days after the discovery, a sensitive and methodical process will now take place over the coming days as the bones are examined and forensic tests are conducted. Various other investigative work and searches will also be carried out, which will need to utilise a number of specialist resources. This process will be time consuming, and so there are not likely to be any significant developments in the early stages. And they were not lying there, it has been an incredibly time consuming process, with further information about the unidentified victim not being released until a whole year later in August 2021. It was revealed at this point that the victim, who they did know was male from early on, was about 5 foot 6 and probably had an athletic or muscular build. The post-mortem was not able to establish any cause of death because the remains were just too decomposed to allow any answers. But testing has also shown that he was North European, so he was white. The unidentified man was likely to have been in his late 50s to early 60s, which is information revealed thanks to radiocarbon dating of the remains. It's also believed that he died at some point between 2008 and 2012, so by the time his remains were found, it's thought that he would have been dead anywhere from 12 to 8 years. Had he been in the River Stour in black bags for all those years? Well, it doesn't seem so. Detective Chief Superintendent Eamon Bridger said the week after the discovery that one of the other things we do know is that it isn't a recent death, so therefore there has been some time between when that individual died and when the bags were deposited in the river. That becomes really significant when we look at the things we're appealing for at the moment. So it certainly seems like investigators were working under the assumption that the bags weren't placed in the river until shortly before they were found, and this raises any number of questions. 
Was the person responsible for the death the one who disposed of the bags? Why did they decide to do it now and risk being caught? Was it someone else entirely who disposed of the bags? Why would you risk putting a body in a river like this where it's quite clearly gonna wash up and be discovered? I mean, disposing of remains that were clearly degraded enough to be separated into bags is gonna be a lot easier than trying to dispose of a full body. Why would you not choose literally any other method? The questions here are just never ending. There are a couple of high profile missing persons cases in the UK who people immediately started speculating the remains could have belonged to in the early days, namely Corey McKeague and Luke Durbin. 23 year old Corey McKeague went missing in September 2016 after a night out in Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk, which is only about 18 miles north of Sudbury, a 30 to 40 minute drive. Luke Durbin was 19 years old and disappeared in May 2006 from Ipswich in Suffolk, which is 21 miles east of Sudbury. Again, he vanished after a night out with friends. It wasn't really crazy to think that the remains could have belonged to either one of these men, and when they heard of the discovery, I'm sure both of their families waited with bated breath. But police were able to rule them both out fairly quickly within just a number of weeks. It definitely wasn't them. In the aftermath of the discovery, police appealed for anyone who found refuse sacks or bin bags in unusual circumstances around Sudbury to contact them immediately. And they also appealed for witnesses of any suspicious activity in the Croftbridge area in the weeks leading up to discovery to come forward, whether that's by speaking to the police directly or through Crime Stoppers. As always, I'll leave contact information down below for the authorities, just in case anyone does have any information they want to share. The authorities have also said that if anyone has any concerns over a male relative, friend or colleague that they haven't seen or heard from since any time between 2008 and 2012, who kind of fits the victim's vague description, they should also contact the Suffolk Police. As well as this, detectives have requested that if anyone drove around this area of Croft Bridge on the week of Monday the 24th of August and they have any dash cam footage, please come forward. I am aware that it's been two and a half years since this, so me sharing that is probably futile, but hey, it won't do any harm. If you have dash cam footage and you live in this area and you happen to have it after two and a half years, maybe take a look. What I deduce from this is that it seems that investigators think the bin bags were placed in the water after that date, so Monday the 24th. The body will be discovered on Thursday 27th, so it really hadn't been there for too long. A shopping trolley was also found further down the river from where the bags were located, and it seems they might have theorised that the bags could have been moved in said trolley. So they also asked if anyone saw the trolley in this location or anywhere along the river again to come forward. At the end of May 2021, there was actually a huge step forward in this case when it was announced that a 26 year old man had been arrested in connection with it. He was also arrested on suspicion of possession of class A drugs with intent to supply. A second man was also arrested in relation to the drug offences, but not in connection with the remains. And this is fascinating to me because this man, the first man arrested, was only 26 years old, meaning that if the suspected time frame was sort of 2008, 2012 for the murder is correct, he would have been 15 to 19 years old. Although granted it's not impossible that a teenager could be the one responsible for this death, we can all probably agree that it's going to be highly unlikely, especially considering how well it seems to have been covered up until the remains were found. Which makes me think that perhaps this man arrested wasn't ever considered an actual suspect in the murder itself, but instead just somehow connected to it. How? That's something I don't know. However, I suppose it doesn't really matter because although he was questioned and remained under investigation for quite a while it seems, ultimately the Suffolk Police have said it will face no further action at this time. It doesn't seem like it was him, or at least the police don't have enough evidence to confirm it was him. The last public appeal made by police in this case seems to come from the end of August this year, so 2022. It looks like they always try and make a fresh appeal around the anniversary of the discovery each year to try and drum up public attention. This year they released a single CCTV image of two potential witnesses, a man and a woman who the police have said they'd like to speak to in connection with the investigation. It has been stressed that this man and woman are being treated as potential witnesses, they are absolutely not suspects. This pair were seen on Wednesday the 19th of August 2020 walking two small dogs and pulling a shopper trolley along Melford Road in Sudbury. Now Melford Road is very close to the crime scene but it is not right next to it so I do wonder why this specific couple have been zoned in on as having potentially seen something. Quite clearly in this case investigators do have a lot more information than they've shared with the public. I don't know if these two people have ever come forward or if the police ever found them, but if you do live in or around Sudbury, it could be worth taking a closer look just in case you might recognise them. 
Although granted, the image is incredibly blurry and you can't exactly see the details of their faces. It actually looks like the women might be wearing face masks and this was August 2020, so that makes sense. As of an article in East Anglian Daily Times from February of this year, investigators have spoken with more than 1,400 people as part of this investigation, with 1,140 statements or reports being taken. They've also collated 1,672 physical and forensic exhibits. This number may well be significantly higher now, with Suffolk Police saying they're following a number of lines of inquiry as this investigation continues. This is very much still an open case, with a number of people dedicated to finding answers. There was due to be an inquest into the man's death in November 2020, but due to the fact that he still hasn't been identified, this has been adjourned. It still hasn't happened and probably won't happen until we have a name. DNA checks found that the victim doesn't match anyone on the UK's missing person database, so it seems that he was never reported as missing by anyone in this country at least. This could suggest the man was a bit of a loner, and I don't say that in a disparaging way. Some people just are. Maybe he was a man who kept to himself, and when he went missing, no one noticed. Or at least no one noticed who would have thought to have reported him missing. Maybe he didn't have any particularly close friends or family, but maybe somebody at the corner shop who served him every day might have noticed that somebody stopped coming in. Maybe there's a pub down the road that noticed a regular stopped coming in for his beer every night. Maybe there's a restaurant who noticed a man stopped coming in to have his favourite meal once a week. People might have noticed, but not the kind of people who would have thought to actually report him as missing. Or, of course, the other alternative is that the ones responsible for his murder were the ones closest to him. Now, I know I'll get a lot of comments saying that genetic genealogy should be done in this case, but that's actually not too much of an option here in the UK. I have actually spoken about this in a video in regards to unidentified people here in the UK before, but not in quite a while, so we're going to talk about it again. This is a shorter episode, so why not make the most of the time we have together? Since genetic genealogy was used in the USA in 2018 to finally capture the elusive Golden State killer, Joseph D'Angelo, it has been applied to many unsolved cases and unidentified people to finally provide answers. With this being the use of genealogical DNA tests in combination with traditional genealogical methods to infer genetic relationships between individuals, something which has proven to be hugely useful in the world of true crime. I'm going to be simplifying a lot for the sake of this video, but essentially you have some DNA, whether that's from a perpetrator in an unsolved crime or DNA from an unidentified person. You extract their DNA profile from that and enter that data into DNA databases, which have seen huge growth in usage thanks to these direct-to-consumer DNA tests like 23andMe and Ancestry.com. Whilst these companies can't automatically send your DNA data off to these databases without your express permission, it does give the individual users access to their own DNA information, which they can then choose to enter into databases like GEDmatch, for example, which is a site built purely for genetic genealogy research. Then, when genetic genealogists working on an unsolved case input the DNA data they have into these databases, a lot of the time it will strike a match with somebody who has a partially matching DNA sample, a blood relative. The vast majority of the time, this is not a close match, you're talking distant, distant cousins. But from there, the genealogist can work back through the family tree, using the DNA information and the information they might know about the unidentified person until they strike closer and closer DNA matches. The last part always involves a bit of good old-fashioned detective work, you've got to actually talk to people, figure out family dynamics, find out where this missing person could sit on the family tree, until you find parents, siblings, uncles, aunts, you do DNA tests with them, you find birth and death certificates, and then you can finally say with certainty who a person is. Sounds like a great system, and there's no denying that it is, but there are also a number of ethical and moral questions that come along with this. And that's where the UK government seems to differ from the USA government, for better or for worse, depends on how you look at it. On the 9th September 2020, so literally just two weeks after the Sudbury Bag of Bones was discovered, the UK government released a research and analysis report asking, should we be making use of genetic genealogy to assist in solving crime? A report on the feasibility of such methods in the UK. A very snappy title. The report talks about the rise of genetic genealogy in the USA and everything I've just shared with you, and how on the back of this, the Biometrics and Forensics Ethics Group were asked to consider the feasibility of this in criminal cases in the UK, and they brought up a number of issues to be considered. 
Interestingly, and maybe slightly off topic, but also not really, the report notes that the process of uploading DNA from a crime scene in the Golden State Killer case to Jedmatch actually violated Jedmatch's terms and conditions of use, which stated that the person submitting the DNA had to declare it was either their own DNA or they were the legal guardian of the DNA donor. Obviously, this wasn't the case, this was law enforcement doing this. 23andMe, Ancestry DNA, and MyHeritage all do not allow law enforcement to use their databases without a warrant. Contributors to GEDmatch must actively opt in now to law enforcement matching, it is not automatic. And obviously the number of profiles which allow this will affect chances of having a successful match. And there's also technical and economic challenges to law enforcement using such technology. Genetic genealogy requires high quality DNA to be recovered from the crime scene to allow DNA profiles to be found. However, I will sort of add that this is becoming less and less relevant with better technology being created every day. In the USA, a company called Paragon carried out an assessment of 200 cases for the suitability of this genealogical approach. About 35% of these were not suitable, which is a pretty high percentage. Most of the time this was because relatives were not in the database, not a single DNA match could be found. And this is a roadblock that we come up against time and time again when we talk about USA cases. Certain ethnic backgrounds are just not represented fully on the databases. For example, this could mean that whilst a white person of North European descent, for example, could be quite easily found using this technique, an East Asian person, again, for example, probably wouldn't be because they just wouldn't be represented in the databases. Does that potentially raise questions around the ethics of using such a thing if a white person has a much higher chance of being identified than an Asian person? Or is that just to be expected in a predominantly white country in North Europe, if we're talking about here in the UK? In the UK, we've used familial searching for serious crimes since 2003, which does include DNA testing, but not to the extent of genetic genealogy. It basically uses standard DNA profiles and ranks the likelihood of a familial relationship between an unknown individual who left DNA at a crime scene and other individuals on the National DNA Database. Here in the UK, the National DNA Database was set up in 1995, and as of 2020, it had 5.6 million individual profiles. Every profile in this database is derived from a sample of human material as collected from crime scenes. It's not a database for every British national, it's just DNA found at crime scenes. Apparently through using just that database, law enforcement can already identify a lot of criminals without any need for further databases. It reads, the UK already has one of the most efficient DNA databases in the world, and conventional methods with appropriately applied familial searches will identify the bulk of perpetrators. Very interestingly, the report actually points out that the brother of Joseph D'Angelo was a convicted felon, and had his DNA profile been available on CODIS, which is the USA equivalent to our database, and they'd used familial searching, D'Angelo could have been apprehended a lot earlier. I'm just taking this report at its word, I don't think a UK government report would be lying. No, no, I could see it, I could see that a UK government report would be lying, but I'm just taking it at face value here. But on top of all this, the main concern here is ethical, legal and safeguarding considerations, with the report reading, the legality and necessity of police use in genetic genealogy in the UK would need to be clearly established, with reference to Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights and the Human Rights Act 1998. The approach should only be used if the established methods already in use are no longer adequate or effective. The biggest ethical concern here comes around the fact that our DNA is not just ours. Our DNA is the amalgamation of everyone who came before us. It has parts in common with our siblings, aunts, uncles, anyone slightly related to us. We share DNA with them. When we give permission for our DNA to be used in such a database, we're also inadvertently giving away the DNA data of anyone we're genetically related to. Just because we, as an individual, would give consent for our DNA to be used as part of a search by law enforcement, that doesn't mean that everyone else in our bloodline does. Does that make sense? There's just a very big ethical concern there. So all in all, as you can see, there are many questions that need to be answered before this genealogical approach could be used on a regular basis here in the UK. The identification of cases where genetic genealogy might be appropriate must be carefully defined to enable an ethical and reasoned decision to be made. 
The concern that the report specifically points out is that they want to avoid historic issues as well and they give the example like the identification and prosecution of women who might have abandoned their newborn babies, something that was illegal but could have been done for myriad reasons. If you allow genealogical testing to be done, this could lead to a whole backlog of cases that might not have had the most ethical grounds for law enforcement involvement but like it's the law so it needs to be looked into. That's not me making that example by the way at all, that's literally what's written in the report. But all of this, this whole report refers to finding criminals and not to the identification of people such as in the Sudbury case. The report does end basically alluding to the fact that it could be used in the future in cases such as this, Indo cases, as it does avoid some of the more contentious issues around genealogical testing. But all in all, the whole process is considered unregulated and ethical, legal and safeguarding issues must be considered. Do I think genetic genealogy is going to be appearing here in the UK anytime soon? absolutely not. Do I think it should? Perhaps. I see all the good it does in the USA. You know how strongly I feel about reuniting people with their identities and apprehending people who need to be apprehended about justice. It's what my whole channel is about and it's such a wonderful feeling when you see someone get their name back. I mean, I've cried over the boy in the box, Joseph Zarelli, multiple times since his name was announced just a couple of weeks back. But do I also understand the UK government's hesitancy here? Absolutely, it is a minefield of ethical considerations. I ended up going much deeper into that than I intended to, but I find it absolutely fascinating and I know a lot of you guys do as well. So do let me know what are your opinions, where do you stand on this? Should it be allowed here in the UK? Should it even be allowed in the USA? Do you think it's gonna become more normal, more normalized around the world? I guess only time will tell. But of course I'll end with a reminder about the Sudbury unidentified man. If you know of a male family member, a friend, a colleague, an acquaintance in their 50s or 60s who went missing between the years of 2008 and 2012, it is of vital importance that you let the authorities know. I'll leave all the contact details in the description box. The UK is a very small place, he could have come from anywhere, England, Scotland, Wales, even Northern Ireland, Ireland or mainland Europe. As I said earlier, I do think the police have more information here than they're letting us know. I really hope they're close to an identification of either the man himself or of the person who killed him, or even the person who disposed of the body in the river. Could that be the same person? Maybe, maybe not. But this is a case I really don't think was covered enough here in the UK media, so hopefully I'm doing my part here. Remember to talk about this. Thank you so much for tuning in today and for just taking the time out of your day to learn about this man, to learn about his case and hopefully get us one step closer to actually having an answer here. I always think it's so incredible when my videos get so many views and it's just people taking the time out of their days to learn about these unsolved cases and to hopefully help spread the word and I just think it's absolutely amazing. So thank you so much and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.